John Brunick, the most decorated captain in the history of the Black Beret. Yet you quit in disgrace. Lost an entire platoon, I believe? No business of yours. So touchy. I suppose that's understandable. What'd they get you for? My wife was carrying a second child. One wasn't enough. He died at birth. What'd they give you? 31 years. You're smiling. How the fuck can you be smiling? She got away. The fortress is the world's largest underground penitentiary. 33 stories deep. Please observe the neutron cannons found at the central core. They destroy only organic matter. Welcome to the fortress. Everything here is the property of the Mentel Corporation. I am prison director Poe. Prepare intestinator tagging. <laughs> you are about to be outfitted with intestinators. Crossing a yellow line will result in pain. Turn it off! Crossing a red line will result in death. Crime does not pay. Five seconds to enter cell. Come on in. What happens if you just walk out there? Try it. Laser perimeter intrusion. <laughs> Step back, please. Don't breathe. This is an unauthorized thought process. What's the matter, Pete? Got a stomach ache? Sit down, 95763. My name is Brennick. Of course it is. He caught her before she reached the far side of the bridge. One child for a woman. We live on a very small and fragile planet. We must maintain the population balance. Abortion is illegal, and that leaves only one alternative. Intestinate Karen Brennick. Intestination commencement. You bastard! Ed? You have nothing. You have nowhere to hide. You are nothing. Release me, or she dies. Fortress hit the big screen in Hungary on the 18th of December 1992. The film received a staggered release throughout 1993 and into 94. It got its US release in September 93 and in the UK of July 94. If you were into importing laser discs from the USA back in the early 90s, you could have watched the movie before its UK release. Costing in a region of 12 to 15 million dollars, it managed to recoup 40 million worldwide. It didn't perform very well in the USA, but thanks to Christopher Lambert and his popularity in Europe, it boosted ticket sales to make the movie a financial success. The film didn't get many favourable reviews at the time. There were complaints the script was more interested in setting up the prison premise than developing a story around it, and it felt like a remake of the Stallone movie Lock Up from 1989, but set the story in the future. But other critics said it had interesting plot twists and the characters were colourful and engaging, and the director Stuart Gordon was clearly having fun with the movie and not taking it too seriously. Fortress is classic sci-fi B-movie fodder for VHS, and that's really where it found its wider audience. Due to its success at the time and its sales on VHS, it spawned a sequel eight years later called Fortress 2 Re-Entry, which will be discussed later in the video. Troy Neighbors and Steven Feinberg wrote Fortress. Steven was interviewed a few years back on YouTube. Steven said Fortress was inspired by living in Cranston, Rhode Island, and would pass the gothic-like ACI prison, and wondered what it would be like to be in there, and thought it would be a great idea to develop a prison movie. He thought instead of bars, there should be laser beams to lock people in, and these security systems in place could monitor your dreams, so you are not planning an escape, essentially dealing with thought crime a very Orwellian future. His friend and colleague Troy joined him to flesh out the script. The name Fortress came from the Sting song Fortress Around Your Heart, which Stephen was listening to a lot while writing. 
The writing pair started to create buzz around the script in Hollywood, phoning up producers and asking them if they had heard or read the script to Fortress, developing an interest with the studios. They eventually sold the script to 20th Century Fox. The film would eventually be distributed by Columbia Pictures in the USA. I presume through connections with Fox, John Davis, who had produced Predator, handled the film and its financing. Steam would say in the interview that about 60% of his script made it into the film, and he would like to remake Fortress if the opportunity came about. The script was written with Arnold Schwarzenegger in mind, with the story describing the character John as a very muscular guy. Lucky for them, Arnold did show a strong interest in playing the part. In search of a director, Stuart Gordon got hired thanks to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold was a fan of the reanimator, and Arnold stunt double Peter Kent was a cast member. Very early on into pre-production, Arnold decided to bow out, and it's unclear why, so the budget was slashed considerably, going from an estimated $70 million to 15. So many ideas had to be scaled back. Christopher Lambert would eventually be cast in the role thanks to his popularity in Europe and the script was rewritten to be tailored to Lambert's sensibilities. Stuart Gordon, when interviewed in recent years, said he loved working with Lambert and that he contributed a lot to the film, from the script to the designs. Lambert would often do a lot of his own stunts, which is surprising considering his poor eyesight. Lambert cannot see without his glasses because he cannot wear contact lenses. He is often forced to act while virtually blind. This has led to injuries while performing his own stunts without glasses. Stuart Gordon did a lot of research and visited a number of prisons in the USA. He went to a place in Northern California called Pelican Bay, which is where they send the worst 2% of all prisoners. It was a state-of-the-art prison at the time, and many of the ideas and designs came out of that visit. The film's production would move to Australia to take advantage of the Warner Roadshow Studios, which was a fairly new studio at the time. Due to its limited budget, shooting in Australia saved the production some money due to the exchange rates of the US dollar to the Australian dollar. Filming took place in September 1991 and finished in December, so a pretty short shooting schedule. Christopher Lambert, the star of Highlander, plays John Brennick, an ex-military guy, because of course he is. They always are in these types of movies. He blames himself for the death of his troops in combat. And once thrown in prison, he becomes to be very protective of people who are treated badly by others and begins to gain the trust of many around him. Lauren Lockin plays John's wife Karen. Lauren would not go on to star in that much over the years and had limited roles in TV and film. She unfortunately didn't return for the sequel. The legendary Kirkwood Smith plays prison director Poe. He helps run the prison on behalf of the Mentel Corporation. He becomes infatuated with Karen after she is captured and taken to the fortress. Once she agrees to live in his quarters to save her husband, she discovers his dark secret. The director Stuart Gordon said that Kirkwood would strive to give the best take, often after the director was happy with what they shot. Kirkwood would want to do it again, saying he can do even better. Clifton Collins plays Nino Gomez. Clifton would go on to have a very successful career and starred in movies such as Star Trek and Pacific Rim. Nino is sent to the prison the same time as John and becomes the victim of abuse from Stiggs and Maddox. Lincoln Kilpatrick, who sadly passed away in 2004, plays Abraham, who is a model prisoner and works for Poe as a manservant and is awaiting his parole. The talented Jeffrey Combs plays D-Day, a machine and demolitions expert, but also has the skills to hack computer systems. Jeffrey worked with Stewart on a number of his movies, and I'm sure most fans recognise him for his work on The Reanimator and Peter Jackson's The Frighteners. Tom Towles plays Stiggs. Tom sadly passed away in 2015. He was often employed to be a tough guy on film or TV, and in typical fashion for Fortress, he plays a similar role. He bullies the others in his cell and takes a liking to Gomez. And finally, we have Vernon Wells playing Maddox. He likes to be in charge of the prison wing and maintains control by intimidating the prisoners. Vernon is always fun to see playing a villain, with his performances in Mad Max 2 and Commando. Set in the future of 2017, oh my god, that is now. John and his wife Karen are expecting to cross the border to Canada. The United States now has a strict rule on couples having children. Only one child is allowed. This is their second child as the last one died during birth. As they attempt to get past security, Karen wears a magnetic vest to trick the scanners, but the vest is spotted by the guards, and John and Karen attempt to flee, but John gets caught and Karen manages to escape. John is taken to the fortress, a maximum security prison, run by the Mentel Corporation, and is sentenced to 31 years in prison. The prison is located underground in the middle of the desert. To maintain discipline, all inmates are implanted with intestinators, which induce severe pain or death as a form of physical control and mental conditioning. 
basically simulates really bad trapped wind. The prison is co-run by director Poe, who oversees Z10, a computer that monitors day-to-day -day activities. John is sent to his cell, which is already overcrowded. All the prisoners are crammed into these cells, secured with laser walls. John, after getting in a fight, is taken to director Poe and learns his wife has been captured and is held in another level with his unborn child, which is now officially owned by Mentel and will be confiscated at birth. Stiggs, who John shares his cell with, has a friend called Maddox, who intimidates the other prisoners to gain a sense of leadership, takes on John. They get into a fight to the death, which results in Maddox being shot by a security turret, after John doesn't let Maddox fall to his death. John manages to grab Maddox's intestinator and gives it to D-Day before he's taken away to be punished with the mind wipe procedure. Poe, since informing John of his wife's imprisonment, has been watching her and has become infatuated with Karen. He offers her a chance to save John. He tells her that if she lives with him, he will treat John well and release him from the mind wipe chamber. Shortly later, Poe is revealed to be a cyborg. Powerfully enhanced by Mentel cybernetics, he doesn't have the ability to make love, but the human side of him desires to have a partner. Four months later, a heavily pregnant Karen manages to use her access to the prison computer in Poe's quarters to help John by restoring his memory, breaking him free from the mind wipe. Karen steals a holographic map and gives it to Abraham to give to John so they can locate a way out of the prison. D-Day dismantles Maddox's intestinator and uses a magnetic component to pull out the other's intestinators. With them now free from Z-10's controls, they can now make their escape. Now I'm going to discuss the ending, which has been edited and trimmed in a number of countries around the world for unknown reasons, so beware big spoilers coming up. In its original form, or say uncut version, John, Nino and Karen escape from the prison. They end up in a barn where Karen goes into labour. Outside the barn, the truck has been taken over by Z10, which overrides its controls. It takes out Nino, which gets John's attention and he attempts to destroy it, and sets fire to it and it careers off into the barn and explodes. John believes his wife has died, but she has got away at the last minute and has given birth. Then it ends. Some parts of Europe, and I believe Australia, received trimmed down versions. This cut down version just has them escape the prison, smashing through a gate, and it dissolves to a scene of John and his wife with the kid. There were also minor trims of violence and moments of dialogue, but thankfully the recent German release on Blu-ray restores these scenes, but they do vary in picture quality. For the movie's relatively low budget, it does incorporate a nice variety of visual effects, which mostly come from the video graphics that are used to represent the security systems that Mentel use. The first big visual effect we are introduced to is a map painting to expand the location of the prison, as we see the prisoners arrive and the mat is used again at the end as you see John, Karen and Gomez escape. To visualise the size of the prison and how far it tunnels into the ground, miniatures are used to great effect. I think these moments really sell the size of the prison and have stood up well over time. The optical effects are limited and are used when John and Maddox have a fight on the bridge and it cuts to long shots to show how high up they are. It may be a result of the print but when it cuts to opticals there is visible dirt. The colours do look faded which is a common issue with the analogue method of combining elements in the optical printer. They are a tad weak for the time but a lot of blue screen had those issues until digital compositing came along. There does seem to be some limited digital work in the film with the wireframe to spare the prison as it's projected by the crystal imposed quarters and during the mind wipe sequence with its trippy effects. They manipulate images of John's past and fears of the future. It appears to look very much like digital video effects that are often employed in music videos. Stuart Gordon never shies away from gore and Fortress comes with its fair share but nothing too over the top. A couple of stomach explosions, with Maddox's being the most gruesome, and some nice exploding cyborgs. For its limited budget, and they were certainly ambitious with their overall design, the visual effects do a good job of serving the script. It's funny how they thought CRT standard TVs would be in the future, with touchscreen interaction that doesn't actually work. <laughs> French composer Frederick Talgorn takes on the duties of providing the orchestral score to Fortress. Frederick worked on Stuart Gordon's Robot Jocks and other movies such as Heavy Metal 2000 and the fairly recent film Asterix at the Olympics. The score unfortunately isn't that impressive to one's ear. It takes on a military march to some of the action cues and sadly doesn't really provide that much of an impact. The cues with John fighting Maddox do sound pretty good. It certainly serves the movie well to create some atmosphere but fundamentally feels a bit by the numbers for me. 
The best stuff really is the emotional musical cues that play out when Poe reveals to John that they have captured his wife. The opening titles have this familiar style to Christopher Young's work on Hellraiser, which I thought fits nicely lending itself to that horror element, but fundamentally the movie is a prison slash action adventure, but it gets away with it. The soundtrack was released on CD in 1993 with only 8 tracks totaling 35 minutes of music, and possibly only released as a promo, so it wasn't something you could easily pick up at the time. This has been out of print for years and to my knowledge is not available via Amazon or iTunes for streaming, so it was really tough to source a copy, but you can sample a few of the tracks on YouTube if you are at all interested. Before we discuss my final thoughts on the movie, let's discuss the sequel Fortress 2 re-entry, which I mentioned earlier. This came out 8 years after the original movie, directed by Jeff Murphy who also directed Young Guns 2, Free Jack and Under Siege 2. Stuart Gordon had apparently been approached to direct but was busy with another project at the time. This sequel was given a theatrical release but in only a handful of countries and only shown in limited theatres in the UK. I remember when it came out and most critics were baffled and confused why they made a sequel. The Mentel Corporation are still after John Brennick and managed to capture him and send him to a new prison located in space and guess what? He has to escape again. This is a perfect example of a pointless sequel. The production design is grey throughout making it very uninteresting to look at and it just repeats everything from the original. They have removed the cyborg control systems and used humans instead, which to its obvious benefits creates small characters for the prisoners to battle with in their attempts to escape. Instead of the intestinate security method, they have something new that affects your brain if you attempt to break the rules. The visual effects are often really bad and look very cheap. One moment has Chris Lambert going into space without a spacesuit, and it's laughably bad as you see him just comped over the background element dangling by wires, and the frame rate begins to drop. I'm really surprised they even attempted to show this in theatres. It's certainly a movie that is clearly aimed at the director DVD market. On a plus side, it does have an interesting lineup of actors. It has Willie Garson, Yuri Okamoto, Pam Grier, and Nick Brimble. Also, the score does have some nice moments, but these are really not enough to warrant any recommendation. A very lousy sequel. Fortress I saw many times on the shelves to rent growing up, and for some reason I never watched it, and it wasn't till far later into my early 20s that I gave it a go. The cover for the VHS tape didn't really tell you much about the film, and it was one of those early examples of a movie poster that had this photoshopped image of an actor's face slapped over it. Maybe looking back into my teens I was probably going through my cynical phase of everything is shit, and this film looked cheap and naff. Thankfully I managed to secure a Laserdisc copy because I couldn't find the DVD. It must have been out of print. The Laserdisc is in pan and scan and not widescreen and of course not presented in high definition. Sourcing for a Blu-ray thankfully proved quite easy for this review. I had tried to get a copy a year or so ago for a possible retrospective, but it was only available in the USA and it was no longer available and fetched high prices from second-hand sellers. But a German release came out this year which had a better picture transfer and only cost £12, so now I had the opportunity to cover it. Fortress is a fine example of a sci-fi movie that borrows many elements and ideas from other films and literature and combines it all into one B-movie escape adventure. It certainly doesn't do anything radically different to what you've seen before with other escape from prison movies, such as Escape from Alcatraz. With it being set in the future, it gets a chance to do something different with the oversubscribed genre and give it a new lick of paint. Fortress is a typical film that deals with the future. It's set in a dystopian world where you live under a tight regime that controls the population and for minor crimes you are severely punished. The film is your standard prison story that throws in a few interesting ideas to give the familiar formula a new twist, which I don't really have a problem with. Does the film do anything interesting with the escape from prison narrative? I think so. It had the head of the prison as a cyborg and the levels of control over one's thought and actions were implemented nicely into the story. It makes the chances of escape far more difficult than having to dig your way out, like most escape films. But ultimately the way they get out is through a heating duct so it does fall into that predictable outcome that comes with prison movies. Christopher Lambert I never really considered an action star. I had only seen him in the Highlander series and Mortal Kombat, and more recently Subway. Both Highlander and Mortal Kombat are part of the action genre, but to me he wasn't in the same category as say Jean-Claude Van Damme. But if you browse Lambert's catalogue of features, he has done his fair share of action movies, but most of them never gained that much success. But I'm sure they found an audience on VHS, hence why there's quite a few of them. I've always had a soft spot for Christopher Lambert, because English is his second language, his accent gives him a unique voice, and he often tends to act with his eyes, and striving to do less with his performance, that ends up giving him more screen presence. Many actors say do less on camera and it works in your favour. 
If you begin to act over the top, it tends to take away from your performance and the audience tend not to be invested. It's interesting that halfway into the movie, Lambert's hair gets really long and he ends up looking like his character from Highlander. And what makes me chuckle, once he gets hold of a gun, he has to do a war cry whenever he fires it. Even though Lambert's the star, Kurtwood Smith is easily the best thing in the movie and is brilliant. Being one of the best actors at portraying a villain, his performance in Robocop clearly proved that. And in Fortress, he's such a cold and ruthless individual, but he's not your predictable villain you tend to see. At first, you think he's a straight up bad guy, but there is a lot more happening with his character and his desires to have a companion and a more human caring side begins to unfold. I felt he's revealed to be a cyborg was a nice twist. He reveals Mentel's intentions to replace the population with cyborgs in order to save on natural resources. But the fundamental issue with its script is that it's more interested in the premise than creating a foundation for this world and setting, which is a problem that was brought up by critics at the time of its release. I think the movie could have explored more of the cyborgs that Mentel are creating, or just giving more details about the corporation's goal and how they have become the dominant force in governing. It's very loose on information. You can still enjoy the film despite not being given all the backstory and motives, but I think it would have greatly benefited the film if a little bit of time could have been put aside to show us the descent into a dark future that has strict controls on the population. It could have been news reports at the beginning or like Mad Max 2, have stock footage with a voiceover to give the audience a cushion of info to feel informed once the characters are introduced. Even though this is considered an action film, it doesn't really have much in it. Action is less of its concern and more about the escape. And when the action does kick in, it's often a bit clumsy with its execution and not very exciting. I don't think it's Stuart Gordon's strongest skill set and he's definitely more interested when it comes to the characters and throwing in nice levels of gore. He does have a good visual eye and does his best to avoid showing off the limited set design outside of the prison levels. Once they are taken inside the prison for the first time, the set dressing is pretty limited and the money was clearly spent on the multi-levels of the prison and the warden's office. Everything else is generic and lacking in areas and most of it's covered in close-ups to hide the obvious limitations. The photographic style is very interesting and you can see a similar look to say Total Recall and Robocop. Fortress does seem to borrow or say take inspiration from those movies and even Lawnmower Man. Fortress nicely fits next to those movies, it may not be of the same quality as Paul Verhoeven's efforts and it isn't as smart with its message and themes of the future, but retains a strong level of enjoyment and that's what's really important. Fortress of course is no masterpiece or going to blow you away with its message of the future or leave you impressed with its visual effects and production design, but at its core it's a fun escape movie that has a group of talented actors who go above and beyond to elevate the script to give us something more than just your generic science fiction romp that dominated the video market back in the day. Fortress, even though it was given a theatrical release and did surprisingly well, I'm sure its real goal was to get a big audience on VHS. Definitely give it a go if you've not managed to see it. It wasn't part of my childhood and you could easily look at the film and think the worst. It's not a well polished movie and clearly has elements that make it a director video kind of affair. I often like to say if a movie is suited for Saturday night viewing, with friends enjoying a takeaway and some beers, Fortress is the perfect example for that recommendation. It doesn't take itself too seriously, it's fun 90s sci-fi schlock. And it has Christopher Lambert and Kurtwood Smith in it. What more could you want? He's been in there for three days. And no one has ever lasted four. It is in your power to stop his pain. But there's a price. I want you to live here. <clears throat> to share my quarters for the remainder of your stay. Why me? I'm looking for a companion. I'm not real friendly to anyone who tortures my husband. We 
going through the construction area here, through this heating pipe. What are you? I'm an ant. You're not human. You're... A monster? A freak? When my kind are in the majority, there will be no more world hunger. No overpopulation. You don't sleep, you don't eat. I was one of Mentel's first babies. It was very special. Oh my God, you want to do with our babies? Of course. John Brennick is thoroughly rehabilitated and is hereby granted a full pardon. He is therefore free to leave the fortress. Before completing the document, there is something you must see in central control. Not now, Zed. Please observe. How dare you spy on my quarters? A report has been filed with the Mentel Board of Directors. You are being relieved of all responsibility. Your replacement will be here within 24 hours. Until then, you are confined to quarters. Shoot them, Zed! This way! You got to pay, you bastard. No! I cannot allow you to put What's the fortress in jeopardy. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.